Good morning, guys. Greetings in the name of Jesus Christ. How are you all doing? We had a coronal mass ejection that happened um, the night before last, and they saw it. It came directly at us. When it hit us, it caused... You talk to some people, it's a 6.1 earthquake. You talk to some people, it's a 6.9 earthquake. But evidently, there were multiple earthquakes. Uh, one in Hawaii that was a 6.1, and the other one was... I uh, can't remember where it was, but it was a 6.9. Um, that's just two of them. There was bunches of them. Uh, you know, we're going to have more of this. More and more and more of this leading up to the time that we're watching for. Um, and it's spoken of in the book of Revelation as part of the end times. The they're, One of the angels is going to pour... It's either a bowl or a vial. You guys know I have terrible memory, but it's a bowl or a vial into the sun. And the sun is going to burn so hot that it's going to, uh, you won't be able to go out in the sun. It'll burn your skin you know, quickly, very quickly. Um, if you guys have been keeping up the last couple of years with what the sun has been doing, it got really quiet there for a while. When it should have been in an active period, it was a very quiet. No solar activity, no CMEs, no nothing. It's weird. And everybody was watching. They're like, what's wrong with the sun? It's never done this before. Then all of a sudden, it got super active, and now it's getting more and more and more and more and more active. Uh, it's throwing coronal mass ejections off in every direction. So it's all leading right to the time we've been told of, right to what's coming. It, it, there's no, you know, whenever you read the book of Revelation, you have to remember that these aren't going to be instantaneous changes. These are going to be the result of changes that have already been happening. God uses his creation to fulfill his will. We got to have events happening now to lead up to the events that will happen in the tribulation. That's what makes everything that's happening now so important because it is leading up to that time frame. Now, there are people that still say, well, but we've had this in the past. Not like this. Not to this level. Not this much at one time. And anybody who's who's been alive more than 20 years... Most most twenty year olds don't pay attention. Anybody who's been alive longer than thirty years, let's say, who's seen some of this stuff, you know, like back in nineteen eighty eight, I never, most of us never knew anything about that, about the rapture happening in nineteen eighty eight, and he, when the book came out, nobody nobody hardly ever knew about it because the world wasn't watching at that time. Nobody was paying attention. It it was irrelevant. to Everybody, the whole world's watching now. The entire world. There are people that thought it was going to happen back in the seventies. Nope. Just a few people were watching back then. The whole world's watching now. There's never a recorded time in human history where the whole world was watching. Because you go back further than that, it was only Israel watching. The whole world was oblivious. Now the whole world's watching. The entire world. <clears throat> and that's one of the big indicators of the time that we're at. Because when you read the book of Revelation, you look at all the prophecies in there, it says these things are going to come upon the whole whole world <coughs> excuse me I gotta have them fluids Oof. okay so if we're seeing all this happen well there should be no surprises we're seeing all the things leading up to the time that's coming the same thing with the Antichrist everybody's watching for the Antichrist why you already see the events leading up to him coming. They've been talking about it for a couple years now over in Israel. Here comes the Messiah. Here's the thing. All this stuff's for the Messiah, and we're watching for him. Okay, well, we're seeing all the lead up to him being presented. Several people over there have said that they've had meetings with him, but he's in the back burner. Why? Second Thessalonians 2. Now we know what's restraining. He can't present himself. We're still here. He has to... We have to be gone in order for him to be presented to the world. However, he's working in the background, leading up to him presenting himself. He, somebody's not just going to walk out of the desert and say, here I am, and everybody's going to accept it. They're going to know who he is in advance. All this has to be set up. In order for him to become a world power, he has to establish himself first. The same thing with all these. You're not just going to have a snap of the finger and a flip of the switch, and all the volcanoes in the earth are going to erupt at once. They have to already be going that direction. That's how all this works. It's how it's always worked. So that we're seeing all these things. Consequently, what I told you guys the other day about the timeline, 
and how we can look and we can see that, you know, most of the evidence shows Jesus died, was buried and resurrected in 31 AD. Well, if we're in the third age, which we are, you can count all the, count the timeline going backwards. We're in the third age, which is 2000 years is an age. You can go uh, and look at, um, in, uh, astronomy and you can look at the, the, how, how all that was set up and how they calculated. It. It's a big giant clock. And you go to these different ages, and each age runs about 2,000 years. So God designed it like that, so it's easy to keep track of. 2031 would be the end of that age. We're in 2021. We're 10 years away from the end of the age. And the beginning of a new age. What's supposed to be the beginning? 1,000 years. Well, that would be 7,000 years from Adam. So it's, it fits perfectly. We're literally right in the final 10 years. Now, seven of those years, because Jesus won't let seven years of tribulation appear in his thousand-year millennial reign. It's going to be less than a thousand years if that happens. So he has to put that, thou that seven years in front of it. Because when he t comes to the earth at the end of the tribulation, that's going to start the millennium. Well, you take that seven years back, that puts you in 2024. We're just over two years away from that. This is the time for the rapture. If it hasn't happened yet, this is the time for it. Now, another fun fact <coughs> is when you look at the different things in the book of Revelation, and this is more confirmation, they've been practicing. We've had all these asteroids flying past us, and they're like, this has got to be debris from a bigger asteroid or something. They've been trying to see if they can steer one. They've been doing these experiments. Of course, most people quit talking about it, but they're, they're putting little rocket boosters and hitting them with nukes and stuff like that, trying to steer asteroids away from us to see if they can do it. Because in 2029, and you can go to the book of Revelation and see that this is spoken about, a bright mountain burning with fire hits the earth and the oceans. In 2029, an asteroid called, funny enough, Apophis is going to, quote unquote, skim past us. Now, if it's going to skim past us, it wouldn't be too hard to, to figure out that it could probably just as easily hit us. And since it's so far away still, they would have a hard time calculating exactly what it's going to do. The name Apophis is the name of an ancient Egyptian god called the god of evil. Apophis is also a pseudonym name for Apollyon who is specifically mentioned in the Bible. This further confirms the timeline we're looking at. Because the Bible says this big, great mountain burning with fire will be cast into the ocean. And it's going to cause the earth to reel. It's going to kill a lot of people. It's going to cause all kinds of problems. All those movies we've been watching, well, that's about to come true. It's more confirmation of the time we're living in. We're seeing all these things culminate. I mean, we have never in the history of the world had a peace agreement in Israel. We have a peace agreement today. And people are like, well, that's not the, the peace agreement of the Antichrist. No, he's going to confirm one. He doesn't bring one. He confirms one, which means it already has to be established. Ding, ding, ding. It's already established. All he has to do is confirm it. The, the timing couldn't be any perf more perfect. And there's people left and right disputing all this stuff. You know what? None of these arguments glorify God. None of these arguments make any sense. We can go to the scriptures, read what the scriptures say, look at the world and go, ooh, well, there it is. Simple, easy. There, there's no, nothing to read around it. If we're seeing all this happen and we can clearly witness what's unfolding out there, we should be Joy, don't get me wrong, these, a lot of this stuff is terrible. But we should be joyful and excited because that means the Lord's about to arrive. Guys, any time between right now as I'm speaking and 2024, two years, what, two years and a couple of months, any time in that time frame is the rapture. If, if that's where all the numbers are pointing, that's our time frame. That's the final time frame. Any time during that time frame, the rapture is going to happen. I personally think there's a gap, just from reading the scriptures, before the tribulation starts. 
any time between right now as I'm speaking, between the filming of this video and, and 2024, the rapture is going to happen. So you now have a, a window, a, a designated window. People right away are going to say, yeah, but what if you're wrong and we go past 2024? Well, what if I'm wrong? I hope I'm wrong. I hope I'm wrong and it happens sooner. But it's not about me being right or wrong. It's about what the Bible shows. It's about what the evidence shows. What are we looking at here? It is completely unreasonable to think that things the way they are now are going to keep going the way they are now. It's impossible. They can't. I mean, well, it's possible with God, but they can't. They can't. This world is ripping itself to pieces. It's not going to continue this way. It's going to continue to degrade unless a miracle happens. And the only miracle I see happening is the complete and utter overthrow and imprisonment of all who seek the evil of people. No, no lesser office, no kick them out of office. I'm talking about imprisonment. Take those people, they have, have them identified and imprison every one of them. That's going to be a, a good chunk of the earth's population. But that's not going to happen, is it? No, because that evil has to be present. See, that evil has to rise up because when we are taken, it's going to backfill that void. That's what's going to make this seven years the worst time the earth has ever seen or ever will see because pure evil will be running rampant, uncontrolled, unhindered across the earth. And I feel sorry for the people who are going to have to be here for that because it's going to be horrible. I don't want to be here for that. I don't want to be here for that. I don't want to see that because I've got enough glimpses of the evil that people can do. I can, I can only imagine how bad that's going to be. But the Bible gives us a very, very clear description of how bad it's going to be. <clears throat> Let your imagination run wild. But we have an encouragement. Even though we see that day very quickly approaching, we have an encouragement. And that encouragement, some of it, is in 1 Peter 1. I'm going to read you the first couple of verses. The first nine verses here. We might even go a little further because I've, I've read the other ones recently. But listen to what this says. Now he's, he's, it sounds like he's talking to Jews, but is he really? Watch what he, how he starts this off. First Peter 1, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the pilgrims of the dispersion of and that's that's a specific word being used there. In Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. Now right away you think he's talking directly to Jews. But is he? See, I've heard other people say this. People that are far more learned than I am. But I'm reading this and I'm thinking, is he only talking to Jews here? Because, verse 2 elect according to the foreknowledge of God. Is that only Jews or is that Jews and Gentiles? Because he knew us too before. So when I read this, I kind of think maybe he's not just talking to Jews. Maybe he's talking to brethren. Brethren are Jew and Gentile because in Christ there is no Jew or Gentile. We're just brethren. Verse 2, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father <clears throat> in sanctification of the Spirit for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace be multiplied. This is a very, very good intro. But when I read this, I don't necessarily believe he's talking to, to, just to Jews. He's because he's giving, he's not giving a specific acknowledgement to just Jews. It's a description of everybody that's in Christ. So that's what it, what it seems like to me. But here's the encouragement, and this encouragement is for all of us. Verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who, according to his abundant mercy, has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that does not fade away. Reserved in heaven for you. Now, I'm going to stop right there for a second. Brothers and sisters, you need to hear this word. This is for you. You need to hear these words of Peter. This is for you. This is not just for the Jew. This is for you. 
Because you have been fighting the good fight. You have been waiting. You have been holding on. You have been getting beat down. You've even beaten yourself down. We're, we are our worst enemies. You've ex you're exhausted. You've exhausted yourself. You, you're tired. You've made yourself tired. We are in a place where we don't want to be here anymore. We don't feel comfortable in this world anymore. We don't desire this world anymore. You know, all I've ever been is a person. I want to go out and see things and go ride around and go. Out. I don't hardly ever leave the house anymore because I just don't feel comfortable here anymore. I don't feel comfortable out there in the world around people. And I didn't notice it until I suddenly noticed it that I was doing that. I hadn't done that before. I have all my life loved to travel. I love to jump in a car and take off and go travel somewhere. I don't want to go anywhere. We got a little, little mini trip coming up to Colorado here. I, I'm not looking forward to it. I don't want to go anywhere. I don't want to be around other people in the world. Because of the evil that there is. And when I am out, I'm on guard all the time. Always watching. Always paying attention. Always looking. Because there's so much evil that has risen up lately. This is talking to us right here. And this is the blessing that we have. Now, you're going to see something very, very, very interesting here. The proof of, of multiple doctrines that we preach contained in this first part of First Peter. So let's go back to verse 3. Let's read it again and let's go back through and I'll, I'll keep going. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. Here's the key verse right here, verse 5. Who are kept by the power of God, so your salvation is not kept by you, it is kept by him, through faith, for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time, the day of redemption. See, a lot of people preach that we've already achieved our full salvation. No, we haven't. Not here. The day of redemption is the achievement of our full salvation. And all the apostles reiterate this point. Verse 6, in this you greatly rejoice. Though now for a little while, if need be, here's your encouragement, you have been grieved by various trials. Verse 7, why, why are we grieved by these things? That the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's not only God's glory and praise and honor, but yours. Because you will be praised, honored, and glorified by the Father at this revealing of Jesus Christ. Verse 8, here's more encouragement. Whom, having not seen, you love. Who? Jesus Christ? Yes. Whom, having not seen, you love. Though now you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Guys, this is another rapture verse. That's the day of redemption, which is the rapture. Right there. We don't keep our salvation. He does. We don't keep our faith. He does. We don't keep none of, none of that. He does. It is waiting for us, incorruptible and imperishable, in heaven, preserved by God, while we are here being cleansed and brought up and taught and changed and converted and sanctified, washed without spot or wrinkle to be presented to the Lord. And then the Lord will present him back to our God and our Lord Jesus Christ. This faith it, that is created in adversity, this faith that is under trial by fire. Jesus is the one bringing the spirit and the fire, right? He's a refiner's fire. This trial by fire in these days. This faith is more precious than gold, more precious than jewels. This faith means something. There's a lot more to this than we understand. It means a lot. This is your encouragement. All this is for something, not for nothing. Now, the, the, the society today wants you to think that you wasted your time. But did you? Did you waste your time having faith in God? Did you waste your time doing the things that you're doing and believing what you were believing in? Living the life that you're living? Have you wasted your time? Have you not seen the evidence and the fruit from the salvation happen right before your eyes? 
I know several people who have confessed recently. In fact, I did a video sharing some good news. <laughs> Witness with their own eyes, God working. Standing in the gauntlet and watching everything fall apart around them, yet it doesn't touch them. I know who you are. It's happening to me too. That's God. Your encouragement is that he is watching over you. That you are standing out in the crowd, a people set apart, peculiar, strange, but amazing all the same. People mock you and scoff at you, but at the same time, people revere you. Sorry if that was loud. I got to keep something to drink on hand in the mornings. <coughs> they may mock you and scoff at you, but they revere you. They look to you as being someone to so totally different. And in a lot of cases, and this is my personal experience, deep down there, they fear. And I've had some people admit this. They fear being around you because just being in your presence, it causes them to be convicted. That's the Holy Spirit, not you. But that's the blessing. And that's the encouragement because the Holy Spirit is present in you. People cannot be in the presence of the Holy Spirit and not be affected. We were changed. And when people get around us, they start to feel that. It, it changes them. It causes them to want to be changed. They don't like it. That's the way the world is. But what's amazing about 1 Peter 1 is we can keep going. Verse 10. Of this salvation, and this is more encouragement, of this salvation, the prophets have inquired and searched carefully. The salvation we have, they wanted to know more about. The salvation we currently enjoy, they wanted to know more about it because they didn't have it. They're not in the age of grace. They weren't of the age of grace. They fall under a different age. Of this salvation, the prophets have inquired and searched carefully. Who prophesied of the grace that would come to you. You are special that you were born in the age of grace. Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ, who was in them, was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. They didn't understand when this was going to come. They wanted to know. They sought to live in our time under the age of grace. Well, you better believe if anybody back then was alive now, they would be handing people their rear end. Y'all better get in the house. You better get in that book. You know, the Bible is the greatest selling book of all time. It holds that title and will always hold that title. It also holds another title. It also holds the title of the least read book of all time. It also holds the title of bookend because it's usually the book that they stick in the end of the shelf to keep the other book standing up. That's terrible because we should be reading this glorious word. If somebody from back then was alive now, Nobody important, just a regular run-of-the-mill Christian from 2,000 years ago. If you brought them to this time now, and they saw this Bible, and they started reading it, <gasps> I know this. I was there for some of this. And they would do nothing but dig through this word, searching it every day. Verse 12, to them it was revealed that, not to themselves, but to us, they were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Things which angels desire to look into. <clears throat> See, no one else understands this age of grace. They understand, don't understand where it's leading. They don't understand what it's going to create. God has stumped them on this for a purpose. See, all of creation awaits the revealing of the sons of God. We haven't been revealed yet. Many of us who have claimed this aren't there. Nobody knows exactly who is who. They can't tell. Only God sees the heart. Because when that time happens, all of creation becomes redeemed. When our day of redemption arrives, all of creation goes into the process of redemption. And it, it waits for us. The prophets were shown these things, but they lived in a time when they, those, these things didn't exist. And they're like, wait a minute, I, I'd want to live there. I want to be alive at that time. Well, they, they were born in their time so that they would be the ones to teach us about what was more important. That's why you need to be reading the prophets, the law and the prophets. It's told us in the, first, in the New Testament that the law and the prophets, everything hinges on that. We, that's where you go learn about those things. And they tell us, watch out for this, watch out for that. Remember, I, we've been reading through Jeremiah and other books. 
how you can hear God speaking across time to us. Those things were meant for them, but they had a secondary effect. And that was to speak to us now, these thousands of years later. To tell us the truth. To help us understand what's going on. And to encourage us. To take more advantage of this age of grace that we have. Not that we can go do what we want to do. But that we have an opportunity to redeem the time. You know what redeeming the time means? Get in that Bible, get into prayer, share the truth with anyone you can. Now, the world's getting tough. Don't get me wrong. It's hard to share this stuff with people. In fact, if you salt most of your conversations with some form of scripture or, or mention of Jesus Christ, most people don't want to talk to you anymore. They want to be around you. It makes them feel uncomfortable because they want to be in the world. But that doesn't mean you change. You keep doing those things. Because when the time comes and that seed sprouts in them, who are they going to come to when they're looking for guidance? The only person they know that knows the scripture, not memorized, but knows it. The only one they know that stands out in the crowd with a shi as a shining light. What was given to us is such a precious gift and we squander it. I'm guilty of it too. What was given to us is such an amazing thing that the prophets of old, men that were alive, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 years ago. Wanted to, they wanted to learn more about this because they were shown things they didn't fully understand. And when it was revealed to them through the Holy Spirit what some of this was, they're like, hey, I want some of that. But it wasn't for them. Even, sadly, John the Baptist wasn't, didn't get a, a chance at this. But he knew what was coming. It's probably why he was so angry all the time. This age of grace started at the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, not before. All those people that were before, that were in, down in Tartarus, that were, they were waiting in Abraham's bosom, waiting for the Lord. When he ascended, he took them with him. But they're part of a different resurrection. They're not part of the, of the resurrection of grace. That's what the Bible seems to indicate. They wanted to know more about this because they wanted to be a part of it. Even the angels don't understand what's going on. They don't, they don't really fully realize what God is doing. See, we're going to be something brand new that's never existed before. That's why it says in the Bible, we don't know what we're going to become. It's not, it hasn't been revealed to us yet. But we know that when Christ is revealed, we will be like him. This is interesting. This is very interesting to me because this tells me that there's something brand new that has never existed that's going to happen. And it will be to the glory of God that this thing manifests. And it will be massive change for the world when this manifests. It's going to be amazing. I don't fully understand it. Most people don't. But we're at the end of the age. Listen, let me say this again. We are at the end of the age. At the end of the age, you go back 6,000 years. At the end of the first age, amazing, incredible things happened. The whole world changed. You go to the end of the second age. Amazing things happen. That was when Jesus was here. The whole world changed. We're now at the end of the third age. Each age encompassing 2,000 years. We're at the end of the third age. <clears throat> and everything is about to completely open up. All the rest of God's prophecy... Well, almost every piece of it is about to be fulfilled. <coughs> We're living at that time. This excites me. This excites me. And the more, especially seeing the numbers, we can pinpoint the year that Jesus ascended, the beginning of the church. Well, we can count forward from there. And go, okay, well, there's, there's 2,000 years. There's the third age. This all involves... Bible study. And, and, and again, I don't have any gifts. I don't have any special gifts or understandings. I'm just reading what it says and applying it to the world. You have that ability too because of the Holy Spirit that's in you. It just requires dedicating some time to reading the Word. 
I will, I will say the Lord has answered my prayers and opened the word up a lot more than I thought he would. And, and I'm so grateful because it, it's clarified so many things and it brings such a level of peace. But guys, brothers and sisters, we are there. And we have a salvation waiting for us that everyone in the past has wanted to know about. Even in our age, the people that lived 500 years ago, 1,000 years ago, 1,500 years ago, 2,000 years ago. Many of them were made aware of events that would happen in the future. They wanted to know more. And as time has gone on, more and more people were like, I, I, I wonder what it's going to be like when we get to that time. Because there were people that started to read through it and was made aware to them, oh, it's not for this time, it's for a future time. Daniel knew about this. This is for a future people, Daniel, not you. I wonder what it'll be like at that time. That's what they were probably thinking. They took great encouragement in knowing, okay, there are people in the future that are going to know about this. And what I'm writing, the Lord is going to preserve for them. That's why there's certain things that the Lord has said, don't write this down. Seal this up. It's not for you, it's for later. <clears throat> it was all going to be preserved. And how amazing is here it is. Here it is telling us what's going to happen, and it's been 100% accurate. I take great encouragement in this, and I hope you guys too. There is, there, there's no, there were better times to live, but there's no greater time to be alive. At the end of the age, to witness the coming of Jesus Christ, to witness him arrive, and to remove his church. What did we read yesterday in Hebrews? He will appear a second time to those who eagerly wait for him. That's us. We eagerly wait for him. Somebody asked me in a comment, so do you believe in a pre, mid, or post-trib rapture? I said, absolutely pre-trib. That's all the Bible teaches. There is no mid- or post-trib rapture. Technically, there is a mid-trib rapture, but it's not for the church. That's for the two witnesses. Technically, there is a post-trib rapture, but it's not for anybody good. It's for all the bad people. All the ones who took the mark that are going to get swept off and thrown into the pit until the thousand years are up and judgment comes. What an amazing time to be alive and to see what we see and to know what we know. How important is what we are doing? We don't fully understand it. A lot of us are in lives where I don't have any effect on anybody. No, you do have an effect. You have an effect on a lot of people. Just you being where you are and sharing the truth. People knowing who you are and you standing for your faith. It makes a difference. When I shared that testimony from Rhonda about that guy that got saved and then his uh, one of his family members was trying to stop the person from coming in there to lead him to Christ. Satan thwarted again. He uses our family members and our friends against us. He uses the world against us. But her being there and doing what she's doing and speaking the way she's speaking and people knowing, that's making a difference. The very fact that she's there with the Holy Spirit dwelling within her changes the people around her. She's told me people have gotten saved. Her. That's good. That's exactly what's supposed to happen. It's amazing. You, where you are, because of the Holy Spirit within you, change what's around you. It's not you changing it. It's the Holy Spirit changing it. In the presence of the Holy Spirit, no one can be the same. We are that emissary. We are that representation. And the day is coming very quickly when we are going to be removed. I mean very quickly. Folks, we're in the final two years in a couple of months. If you, if the calculate, you look at all the calculations, we're right there. And this is the time it's going to happen. It, we thought it was going to happen before. It hasn't. But we're in that time. And amazingly enough, we're, it, that falls within that 80 years. A generation is 70 years, or 80 years, no, 70 years, 80 if by strength. But its boast is labor and sorrows. And then we're gone. Psalm 90.10. So many people thought it was going to be at the 70-year mark. No. It doesn't necessarily mean anything. 
But look at what's happened in that time frame. Look at what's unfolded and look at where we're at. Guys, we're there. We're there, we're there, we're there. Think about what Psalm 9010 says. A generation of 70 years, 80, if by strength, but its boast is labor and sorrows. That means you'll make it 70 years, but if you go 80 years, that generation goes 80 years, it's going to be, be through a lot of trials and a lot of tribulations and a lot of problems. Hmm. Well, take seven years off of that, and where does that put you? 73rd year. Where are we at right now? 73rd year. I'm just saying. It's amazing. It, I'm still completely blown away of where we're at. And you look at the world, and it's like everything seems normal. But then you look a little deeper and look in the Bible, and you realize, oh, nope, it's not. Everything's about to fly apart. And it will only happen when we're removed. The video that I watched yesterday um, that uh, Faith had sent me, the, the guy was talking about California, and she, she had brought this up. That uh, he said, you you know why the San Andreas hasn't broken and California hasn't slid off in the ocean? And, and it was an older video, but he makes the point. He said, because in San Francisco, there's 50,000 Christians praying every day. And he goes, that's why it hasn't broken off. And I completely agree with him. You look at, at just America. Don't look at the rest of the world. Just look at America. How many states are either flooded or um, are on fire? How many states are in economic collapse? How many states are have war zones in their streets? And how many don't? Amazingly enough, the ones that do are the ones that don't have any Christians in them. The ones that don't are the ones that have the biggest Christian populations in them. Governor Greg Abbott just passed a new abortion bill. It's going the right direction. It's not exactly where it should be, but it's going the right direction. Passed another one just yesterday. No business, organization, whatever in Texas can establish mandates for the vaccine. Because you see what's happening elsewhere. No one can do it in Texas. Now, they're going to try to fight that, of course, but no one can do it. We're fighting for what's right here. Texas is doing fantastic. All the other people are talking about all these issues they're having. We're not having those issues here. Why? Large Christian population. Florida. Large Christian population. Several other states have large Christian populations. God protects where his people are. And when he pours his blessing out on his people, it pours out on the, the area around them. It rains on the just and the unjust at the same time. The reason why nothing has... We should have been at war multiple times over in the last two years. Why haven't we done that? Holy Spirit's still here. The Antichrist has been proposed to be presented several times in the last two years. Why? Holy Spirit. We've had asteroids. We had an asteroid, guys, in, a, in the last two years. We had an asteroid fly so close to the Earth, and it was a big one, that it skimmed through the atmosphere and ships at sea saw it. And luckily, it kept on going. But they saw it. Why didn't it hit the earth? Holy Spirit. So many things should have... Yellowstone is past due for an eruption. And when it erupts, it's going to wipe out the United States. Why hasn't it done that? Holy Spirit. You better believe when that Holy Spirit is removed from this earth, all hell will literally break loose on this earth. It will break open and evil, like, like the world has never seen, is going to pour forth freely with no restraint. That's what the seven years is supposed to be. Now, again, according to the calculations, according to what the Bible is showing us, we're only about two years from that. Now, that should terrify people, but it should also make you excited because that means our redemption is right before that. I don't know how else to say it or what else to say to encourage people. All I can do is share them what I'm seeing and what the scriptures say. All I can do is is let you hear my excitement and my, you know, be, I'm filled with excitement for this. You know, and, and, and while it's terrifying, 
to watch what's happening and to know that a lot of people are going to go through this, it's also exhilarating and, and confirming that the justice of God is going to be done. And that's one of the, the characteristics of a born-again believer with the Holy Spirit indwelling, is that their desire for the justice of God to be done becomes more prominent. Because when his justice is done, everything's better. When the aspects and the desires and the will of God becomes more important than your will and the will of the world, you start to look forward to the things of God. And there may be a lot of terrible stuff that happens, but we deserve it. We deserve it. And let's be honest, we're saved, but we deserve anything that happens because of what we are and what we do. By the grace of God, by his mercy and love, he spares even the world around us when he spares us. What an amazing mercy and amazing love. But you see what happens when entities or when groups turn away from him so completely. His justice arrives. He hasn't condemned the whole nation of America, but he's gone after certain states who decided, eh, we're just going to let them go ahead and do whatever they want to do. They can kill babies all they want. Well, that state is either underwater or fully burned up. <laughs> there are states that are burned up and have almost no trees left, and they're still burning. But where's the fuel coming from? They burned it all up already. It's very evident to see. Nations, other, other, other countries, look at them. Some are doing great. They still have a large Christian population. Others, where they've obliterated it, falling completely apart, total economic collapse, everything falling in on itself. Floods, fires, destructions, everything. When you turn your back on God, God turns his hand away from you. He pays attention to those who are faithful. The great falling away is underway, full force. And God is showing his hand. But folks, there's a day coming when he pulls his hand completely off this earth. And when it does, that earth is going to twist and tilt and start flinging itself apart. I feel sorry for the people that are here, but that is why I don't ever hold back talking about the truth. I don't ever hold back sharing the truth with people and, and conversing with people. That's why I, I keep doing this every day, sharing with you guys what I'm being led led to in the scriptures, trying to encourage everybody, trying to help everybody, feed the sheep, Just encourage the brethren, strengthen what remains. And to remind you guys, the Lord is coming for his church. He's going to remove us before he starts pouring his wrath out on this earth. We have that to look forward to, the blessed hope. And whatever this world wants to throw at us, let it, let it do it. We have better waiting. Let's pray. Father, we come before you this morning in the name of Jesus Christ to give you praise, honor, and glory, to lift you up and sing praises unto your holy name. Father, we thank you for your amazing word that you have preserved over all this time that people in the past sought to read, sought to have full access to, and were denied because they wanted to know more about what you were showing them. They wanted to understand more or even engage into what you were showing them that we would have access to. And here we are, we have it. And what's amazing is that you gave us this amazing grace and the full collection of your word spoken by those same people to go to, to learn from, to teach us, to help us. <clears throat> and yet we ignore it more than any other <laughs> book there is. The Bible holds the two greatest titles, most sold book and most ignored book. Father, I pray that you put that uncontrollable desire to read your word on our hearts so that we will be in this word. We know there's not much time. We can see by the calculations given, by the dates given, we can see we don't have very little time left. And you, when you showed me that, you have put that on my heart to share that as much as I can to help people understand that there's no time left. We're in the final steps leading up to the finish line. Father, I pray that we are winners at that finish line. I pray that we are found worthy. I pray that we are establishing 
your truth here, planting seeds while we're still here, while it's still daytime, because the darkness is coming. I thank you that we have an encouragement and a blessed hope to look forward to, a, a removal, a rescue, a, a change of location coming, where we are going to be removed, and then you're going to pour your wrath out on this earth. And it's not that it's an escape, because it is, but it's that we get to go be where we really want to be, which we don't want to be here anymore. The more you te teach us, the more we desire to go and be with you, to be in heaven, to be with our Lord. And that is what we're looking forward to, that removal to take us where you are. No more sin, no more temptation, no more pain, no more struggles. And we can stand in the full glory of our God and in your love and in your mercy and grace, right at your throne. And we get to watch our Lord, who won the victory, take the scroll out of your hand. Revelation chapter 5, Daniel chapter 7. Take the scroll out of your hand and break that first seal. We get to watch one of the most glorious events happen. Him take his kingdom back. The, the rapture is so much more than just a removal. It's a, a reconciling. It's a recovery. It's a it's a What's the word I'm looking for? Redetermination? I don't know. That's what popped into my head. To what's right. And your justice is going to be done. That's what we desire. That's what we pray for. That's what we wish for. Your justice to be done. Because we know when your justice is done, everything is set right. Everything is put where it's supposed to be. Those who decided they don't want to be with you will go where they've decided to go. Those that have will go where they have decided to go. And all will be set right. Father, we can't praise you enough for the amazing revelation and, and opening and revealing of what's in your word. So many little details have popped out lately. And you've just peeled this open and taken and opened the book, but then taken the pages and separated the pages and shown what's in there. Deeper into your word, more of the emotion and the understanding and it's just glorious and amazing, and I can't express this enough. And even First Peter here, everybody pretty much accepts he's talking just to Jews, but I don't see that. And that's just by the wording that's in here. He's not talking to Jews, he's talking to us, all of us who were saved. Thank you, Father, for choosing us from the foundation of the world to be saved. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for delivering us through your sacrifice that we may enter heaven. That we have something greater to look forward to than death. Because in this world, that's all there is. But that there we have life, true, actual life, eternal life waiting on the other side. Thank you, Father, that you've shown us such incredible mercy and grace. That you chose us to be born in this age of grace, at the end, to see all these amazing things. Because that is an encouragement. To be alive now? How many people will we see in heaven that will ask us, what was it like? What was it like? To see the prophecies come active in your lifetime. I, I never got to see it. I lived too long ago. People are going to come up to us and ask us, what was it like all that stuff that was happening? What did, what did you experience? What, what did you see? What did you hear? What was it like when you read the Bible at that time? So many people, are, I know, they're going to ask questions. What was it? What, what was it? What did it feel like seeing that, having that much evil in the world at that time, knowing that it was that close? And you chose us for this. Father, I pray we fulfill your will. I pray no matter what we pray for, your will is done. No matter what in this earth. Concerning all things. Concerning all peoples. In Jesus' name, we bless you and praise you. In Jesus' name, we honor you and glorify you. And in Jesus Christ's name, we pray. Amen. Thank you guys for joining me for daily prayer. I, I just can't express enough how amazing this time frame is. And you know, it's only going to become real for some people when the rapture happens. It's only going to become really, really real and tangible when the switch is flipped. Because once we're taken off this earth, this instant we're removed, in the twinkling of an eye, so quick we won't even register it. It's faster than the blinking of your eyes.
At that exact moment, evil will pour right back into that void and fill that vacuum. And let me tell you, the power that's going to be released is going to be so intense that the world is going to reel from it. And society is going to struggle to come to terms with what just happened. And I kind of get the impression they're not even going to have a chance to really address it because immediately the earth is going to be thrown into turmoil. Immediately everything is going to go ballistic. They won't have time to fully realize or come to terms with what happened because they're immediately going to have to fight for their lives. Share the truth with everyone you can. Give the gospel everywhere you can. Gospel tracts. Leave Bibles open with bookmarks and something, anything. Every conversation you have, let the Holy Spirit lead you and share scripture that applies. Once I get started, like when I was talking to my wife last night, once I get started, I can't stop. It's that important to me and it means that much to me. I bless you guys. I love you all very much and I bless you guys in Jesus' mighty name. I pray he blesses you richly too. And I pray that this is encouraging for you. Look to him. Look to his word. Look at what I'm showing you. Prove it to yourself. Because this should excite you. To see that the finish line's right there. See you guys in the next video.